1 Kings chapter 17, we'll pick up where we left off yesterday in verse number 8. And then we'll read and have prayer and jump right into the message. Verse number 8, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but an handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Uh, Pastor Jay, will you pray for us, please? Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. By way of review, yesterday we spoke about the trials of faith. The trials of faith. And we talked about how that trials come to the best of God's servants. And we saw how Elijah went through some trouble and trial. Even though he is the preacher, he still falls under the famine that comes in the land as a result of a lack of rain and a lack of water. Dr. Rugman, he said uh, it was so dry that thousands of bullfrogs grew up without learning how to swim. <laughs> he said it was so dry that Methodists, the Baptists were sprinkling them and the Methodists were baptizing people with a damp rag. <laughs> I mean, it was dry. It was dry as cracker juice. And so we learned how Elijah went through this trial of his faith here he is serving God, and God did some amazing things by putting him next to this brook, but eventually the brook dried up, and he had a trial of his faith. Now today I want us to look at this portion of Scripture, and I want us to talk about the trust of faith. The trust of faith. Simply trusting God and leaving the results to God. You see, it's not about the brook. It's not about the woman. It's not about the barrel. It's not about the meal in the barrel. It's not about the fire from heaven. And it's not about the mantle. It's all about God. And we are to trust God. The first thing I want to say in verse number 8, you'll notice that the trust of our faith is simply trusting the Word of God. Trusting the Word of God. Notice in verse number 8, the Word of the Lord came unto him. You'll see the plainness of it. It's very clear, very plain. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Now go back to verse number 1 of the same chapter and notice what Elijah said to Ahab. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. 
Now you see how Elijah, he is saying exactly what God's telling him. There's the plainness of it. That's why good, strong Bible preaching will be plain. Amen. It'll be over the plate, waist high, where you can hit it. And there's a plainness of it. God tells Elijah, look, I want you to get up. I know the brook's dried up. The ravens aren't coming back. Get up and go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. You know, the will of God is, is kind of like car lights. Uh, you think about it, now you're driving down the road, especially if you get out in the country like Brother was describing this morning, and you get into a place and your lights, they only can go so far. And you're going down the way there and you're driving and your lights in a dark night only shine so far and if there are no other lights around, city lights or anything, you can only see really just a few hundred feet in front of you. And what God does through the Word of God is He gives you the instruction to trust Him for the light that He reveals to you. Can I say this to some of you newer Christians here? Just be patient. Number one, be patient on the Lord. Number two, be patient with the brothers and sisters because you're going to find you are, I know all of you are members of the most amazing churches with the most amazing pastors, but you're going to find out Christians can sometimes let you down. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient with others. Be patient with the Lord, but be patient with yourself. I mean, you're not going to start off where some of the other pastors are. You're not going to start off where Pastor Stevenson's at. You're not going to start off where Pastor Kim and Pastor Jay's at. You just need to start off where God has you and go in the light that he's revealed. It's very plain. He says, hey, I want you to read my word. Hey, I want you to attend church. Hey, I want you to tell others about me. Quit making it so complicated. There's a plainness and there's a simplicity in serving Jesus. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. So there's a plainness in the Word of God. You'll notice here in verses 9 and 10, he uses that word three times again like he saw, we saw yesterday. Look at it in verses 9 and 10. He uses the word there. You see it? Yes. Get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So God emphasizes there. You need to be there. You say, Where is that? That is the place God has you. It's very plain, it's very clear, it's very simple. Just be obedient where God has you. You know, that's the place where the menial becomes the miraculous. Now look at this lady. She's just out gathering sticks. She's got to gather sticks so she can light a fire and she can cook some things. That's just the menial task. The menial becomes the miraculous. You know, there is the place where severity becomes surplus. Severity becomes surplus. It's a desperate time. And God's about to do some amazing things here in this passage. You also notice a pattern here as we study Elijah. When you go back to verse number 2, you'll notice the word of the Lord came unto him. You'll notice in verse number 5, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Notice verse 8, the word of the Lord came unto him. Then you'll notice verse number 10, so he arose and went. Okay. There's a pattern here. It's not just the plainness of God's word. There's a pattern of obeying God's word. God wants you to obey what he tells you to obey. Now look, there's some variation here. Like I said, some of you are starting at a certain place in your life. Some, are, some of you others are further down the road. You need to obey where God has you Amen. obeying and just be faithful. But then there's the puzzle of it. There's the puzzle of it. Look in verse number 9. He tells him to go to Zarephath. Now this passage is actually mentioned by the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter number 9, and he mentions this great story how God used this Phoenician woman to take care of Elijah. And that place is called Sarepta in the New Testament. That's the Greek way to say Zarephath. So if you go to your Bible maps and you're trying to find this place, you need to look for the Greek, the Greek words Sarepta instead of Zarephath to find where it's at. And this amazing, this is a puzzle really of how God's doing some things because 
He is going about 100 miles. I mean, in this famine, Elijah's walking through and he sees the results of the famine, a 100-mile walk to go to Zidon, which, by the way, as we think, put on our thinking caps and remember who we're dealing with here, Ahab and Jezebel. Who is Jezebel? Jezebel is the daughter of the king of the Zidonians who worshiped Baal. God is telling Elijah to go in enemy territory. The very place you would think he would need to hide from. He says, I want you to go there because there I've commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. They were the Phoenician people who worshiped Baal, the false god. Zarephath actually means refinement. It might have been a place where they refined minerals. Who knows exactly the... The, the reason that word is, is, is that way, but it means refinement. So what God's doing when he takes, tells us to step out and trust him by faith, he's refining our faith. And so he tells Elijah, you go to Zarephath, the very place you think he would hide from. You know what the Lord does? The Lord says, you know what? I want you to go to school over here. And there's a lot of heathen in the school. Or like we say it down south, heathen. Repeat after me, heathen, 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 bunch of heathen down there. <laughs> now I'm preaching. <laughs> God will have you to go to that workplace with a bunch of reprobates. God will have you in that school. God will have you among family members. And he'll have you in the very place you thought you needed to get away from. But Jesus said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil in the world. You can't influence a world that you never touch. And God will have you rubbing shoulders with people, and that's why you have to be prayed up, so you can be a blessing to them, so you can rub off on them instead of them rubbing off on you. So the very place there's the puzzle of it, and you wonder, why, God? Why do you have me out here in the desert land? Why do you have me in the Zidonians? Why do you have me out here with no other Bible-believing fellowship? Why have you done this? Well, maybe there's a reason. God's refining you, and He's going to use you for a purpose greater than you can ever have imagined. Just be patient with what the Lord's going to do. It's a place of refinement. Our job is to trust in our faith, we are to have trust in what the Lord's doing. You see, this lady is going to reach what we call the bottom of the barrel. I don't know if any of you have ever used that expression. There are a lot of Bible expressions that we use in American colloquialism. And the phrase, the bottom of the barrel. I've reached the bottom of the barrel. For some of you, it might be the bottom of the sugar bowl. If you still eat sugar. Uh, <laughs> When I was a kid, when we didn't have candy, you know, we didn't get candy all the time like kids do now. When we didn't have candy, I would go and get my big spoon and dip it in the sugar bowl. I do not recommend that, young ones. My young Padawan learners, please do not take that advice from me. That'll give you a sugar high real quick. But when you reach the bottom of that barrel, you have nothing left. And God says, I'm going to get you to a place where you'll trust me at the bottom of the barrel. When you reach in and there's nothing, when you open the pocketbook, there's nothing there. God says, now you can trust me. Now we can refine you. Very easy outline for you, those of you taking notes. We trust the word of God. Number two, we trust the ways of God. We trust the ways of God. Now there's the paradox of it. The paradox of it. Here's Elijah, and he's in a pretty desperate situation. The brooks run dry. The ravens quit bringing food from Ahab's kitchen. Don't you know that's probably where they went and got it? <laughs> That'd be just like the Lord. He'd send those ravens right outside the chef's door. And the chef would be preparing the finest meats for Ahab and Jezebel. And the chef would turn around to grab something, turn back around, the raven would be right in the window, and he'd snatch it out of there. He'd take it over there and drop it for Elijah. But all that stopped. The brook dried up. The ravens quit bringing the food. And God says, I'm going to send you. This is my way. <laughs> That's God's ways. I'm going to send you to a widow woman. The paradox of it. Surely God, God would have sent him to a wealthy person. 
Someone that had sustenance. Someone that had a great supply. Somebody that could take care of the prophet. Maybe like the great woman of Shunem. But no, he chooses to use this widow woman that has nothing. You know what the Lord will do? He'll, he'll get little groups, little pockets of Bible believers here and there. They don't have two pennies to, raise, to rub together. It's kind of like you take two pennies and you put them in the cage and you say, produce some more. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But you know what he'll do? He'll take Bible believers like that, little churches like ours. I would say all of our churches on a large scale are small churches, comparatively speaking. And God will use little churches like ours to support missionaries all over the world. That's where the majority of missionaries get their funding from, to go overseas, small pockets of Bible believers like us. God will choose to use little churches and little pastors. Humble pastors. <laughs> like all of us here. <laughs> the paradox of it. That's what God chooses to do. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I'm, I'm sometimes intimidated. I don't have the Bible knowledge. I don't have the, the skill. And I don't have the abilities to do things that all these others are doing. Well, I've got some good news for you. You are a prime candidate for God to use. God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, the base things of the world. God takes fools and he turns the counsel of the wise around with little people like us. The paradox of it, you see, that's the way God does things. I'm always suspicious of these professional ministries. But look, I believe we ought to, you know, we are very respectable people, aren't we? I believe we at least ought to have a little bit of uh, couth, at least on Sunday mornings. But I get a little suspicious of these professional ministries. The website is just right. The business cards are just right. You know, everything is just so. It's, it's, the operation could run perfectly well even if the Holy Spirit never showed up. Things would just keep right on moving according to schedule. The paradox of it, God chooses to use small things. God uses this widow woman with nothing to sustain and take care of the prophet. You see, during the famine, you have a time of testing. A famine, people get depleted. In a famine, people get desperate. They get dry. They get dirty. And the danger of a famine is whenever you get to the bottom of the barrel, you find out what people are really made of. Now, as long as we're well hydrated, by the way, public service announcement, please keep hydrated. Because literally, if you do not keep hydrated, and that means water, not sodas and all the other junk. You need to drink water. You say, I don't like it. Well, you need to learn to like it. Yes. Most of your body's water. You need to drink water. And what will happen is, if you don't drink that water, then you will be depleted. Yes. And not only does a famine leave people dry and depleted, but it leads to a, a, a deception. People can get, they can hallucinate. I don't know about you, I've passed out several times in my life. I don't know, some of you, maybe you have. And it's not a fun thing. And you're out there in the heat and all of a sudden everything, you start seeing stars, you know. And the next thing you know, you're out. But a famine, what it does, it gets you to a place where you don't have anything and you find out what you're really like. You know, when people, the brother mentioned it this morning and popcorn preaching, which was great, by the way. You guys get a, did a great job. Amen. Brother uh, Caleb mentioned, I think, when you get not just hungry, but when you get hangry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it gets about 10.30, 11 o'clock maybe. Yeah. You had not had anything to eat. Some of you, maybe you don't eat breakfast, 10.30, 11 o'clock, man. You're kind of a grouch. Yeah. And you know, you start going without and you don't have food and you don't have supplies like you need and maybe you don't have the comforts, you find out what you're really made of. You find out if you get to the place where you can trust God or not. It's easy to talk about how good God is when the bank account's full. It's easy to talk about how great God is when you're nice and healthy and you feel good. It's easy to talk about how wonderful the Savior is when everything's going smooth in all of your relationships. When our churches are doing great, when our kids and our families are doing great, it's easy to talk about how good God is. But when you reach the bottom of the barrel... And on the horizon, it looks like you're about to bury somebody, namely your little boy, because you don't have enough food to feed him. 
you find out whether or not you're going to trust God. So that's the ways of God. It's a paradox. But it's also, you'll notice the attitude here. Look in verse number 12. It brings it out. Look what she says here. She said, as the Lord thy God liveth, which might be an indication she's not a Baal worshiper. Amen. You see, Jezebel was telling everybody Jehovah was dead and Baal was alive. Elijah shows up and says, as the Lord God of hosts liveth, before whom I stand. He's alive and well. And she says, as the Lord liveth. He's like, I found a sister in Christ. <laughs> that should have been a clue to him that he's not the only one. Yeah. It wasn't, but should have been. And notice she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not. A cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Notice her attitude in verse 12. She said, I have not. She said, I have not. That's what a lot of people say. God tells you to do something, you say, I have not. God maybe tries to encourage you. Maybe you need to go on the mission field, and He gives a call, and you say, I have not. I have not the ability. God tells you to give, and you say, I have not. She had a whole lot more than she realized. Notice in verse number 12, she does have a handful of meal. She does have a barrel. She does have a little oil. She does have a cruise. And she does have a son. But she said, I have not. You know what we do all the time? We live our lives looking at the things we don't have instead of the blessings that we do have. And I'm preaching to myself right now, so I'll go ahead and sit down. We look around and all we can see is what has been taken away instead of what has been given to us. Quit saying, I have not, and start saying, by God's grace, I have. The Bible says it's accepted according to a man hath, not according to that he hath not. You know what God's looking for? God's looking for what you have, not for what you don't have. He's looking for your availability, not your abilities. She said, I have not. What's your attitude? Maybe the reason you don't trust God is because of your attitude. What is your attitude? Do you see life as what is being taken from you or life as what God has richly given you? Boy, I think we could learn from this. She says, I have not. She's got a whole lot more than she realizes. And then you'll notice not just the paradox of trusting the ways of God, but the priority of trusting the ways of God. Look in verse 13. Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. Somebody said, don't let the urgent take place of the important in your life. Now when you say, I have not, notice what Elijah said to her in verse 13. Fear not. So what we do out of fear, we say, I have not. We say, I can't. We say, I have not, and God says, fear not. We say, can God provide a table in the wilderness? And God takes it like the old preacher did and turns it around and says, God can. Yes. Amen. We say, I have not, and God says, fear not. Amen. That's real good. There's not just the paradox of this whole thing, but there's the priority of it. He says, look, I need you. I know what you say you're going to do, but first, yes. go make me a cake and bring it to me first. Don't be afraid to serve God. You do what God had said. You, that's trust. You know, we're big Bible believers. You know, we use that term, believer. And that is actually a term you find early on in the book of Acts. They were believers. Now, they didn't fully understand everything early on. We know they, under, they did believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That was a prerequisite. But later on, they understand the substitutionary atonement of that. They understand and they get that. But early on, the Bible calls them believers. We are believers. So that simply means we should believe God enough to trust Amen. and step out. And that means we should make the Lord a priority. A priority in our life. Notice... Verse number 13, don't be afraid to serve God, first of all, primarily. Primarily. 
I've told you about my dad, and my dad was a great Christian man, my mentor, and he, um, he, he was not a preacher, uh, but he uh, loved the Lord, and he yeah. served the Lord all of his life. He worked for civil service, and he worked for uh, 50 years, including his four years of Navy service, 50 years and retired. And he made the comment, he said, they said, what do you do? He goes, well, I serve the Lord, but I, I work here so I can eat. <laughs> I serve the Lord, but I work here so I can eat. And so the idea is that primarily, what are you here for? I don't care if you're a preacher or not. Can I go ahead and, and maybe ease some of your burden, you young guys that are on fire for the Lord? I, 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 hey, I want to fan the flames. Man, I love the zeal. I like it. I love it. Every young man is not called to preach. Now, you're called to testify and you're called to witness. And I understand getting on a street corner and quoting verses and doing that. But I'm talking about in the ministry. Every young man doesn't have to be in the ministry. It's okay. And we're not going to look down on you and you say, well, I don't think I'm called to preach. I believe if my dad would have been called to preach, I believe he would have answered that call. But he wasn't called to preach. Doesn't make him any less a Christian. He still served Jesus primarily. He was number one in his life. You ladies in here, you're not called to preach. Let me go ahead and tell you. Now again, you're called to witness. You're called to testify. You're called to encourage others. And you pastor's wives, you are called to nudge your, your pastors. <laughs> you, you call them Lord, little L. That's what my wife tells. She says, he's my Lord, little L. That's what the Bible says about Sarah in 1 Peter. She called him Lord, little L, you know. Um, but you're, you're not called to pastor a church. And it's Okay. But you're still called to serve Jesus primarily. Yes. He is to be number one. Amen. Notice verse 13, Elijah, he says, I'm first. Primarily, then notice not only primarily, but completely. In verse number 11, he said, bring me a morsel of bread in thine hand. Completely, not just drink. See, she goes to get him some water at first, and he goes, oh yeah, by the way, uh, bring me some food. Uh, the Lord doesn't just want your water. He wants your food as well. He wants everything. Some of you, I don't know, we're going to see that in this text, but maybe, maybe he doesn't want your voice as much as he wants your pocketbook. Maybe that's where you are in your Christian life. Maybe he doesn't want your pocketbook as much as he wants your time. Maybe there's areas in your life where you have said, it's mine, and that time is mine, and I'm going to hold on. This is me. I need me some me time. No, you need me in Jesus' time. Amen. Serve him primarily, serve him completely. Notice also, serve him sacrificially. Serve, serve him sacrificially. She says, I don't have anything left, but just enough to make a little, I think of down south we do those uh, hoe cakes. We'll take the cornbread and you fry it on top of the stove. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm seeing that. Yes, sir, brother. Man, you get that, uh, you get that oil, get old lard. Get lard and a cast iron pan and heat it up and let that lard get good and, and, and mix that cornmeal up with a little egg and pour it on top of there and let that thing fry on top of the stove. And get you some, uh, we, where I'm from, we like the, uh, we call them white acre peas, little small peas. Or get some uh, black eyed peas and hog jowl and collard greens. <laughs> Man, you put that in there and you eat them, they're so greasy, it makes your socks slide down. <laughs> and I, I picture her with that little hoe cake. She says, that's all I got. And he goes, well, you bring it to me first. She just had enough for a little bit. And he says, I want you to sacrifice it. The bottom of the barrel, you give what you have to me. The question is not, what would you do if you had a million dollars? The question is, what are you doing with the dollars you do have? Yeah. It's one thing to give over what's on the top. It's another thing to give from the bottom of the barrel. Sacrificially. Primarily, completely, sacrificially. And here's the best part. Beneficially. Beneficially. Because what happens in the end, she gives, but then she gets back. And that's the whole method of not just giving monetarily, but giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us far more than we ever give to Him. 
And so she gets back beneficially. She and her son are fed. You know, I think about the idea of trusting the ways of God. It all has to do with faith. We're Bible believers, right? We're supposed to believe. Do you believe God? Do you believe God? The story is told about a southern town, or it might have been a midwestern town, probably was, with the drought that came through. And it was so bad that before they had all the modern irrigation methods where they drained the aquifers dry, the town was in a very bad way because the farmers' crops were dying. The preachers all got together and said, hey, let's get all the residents of the town together and let's gather around the community and let's pray. Let's ask God to send some rain. And by the way, may I say this? God controls the weather. God controls whether or not we have food or not. So they got together and they prayed and there's people out there, they brought, uh, some people brought their Bibles, some people that were more orthodox, they might have brought, uh, or I say orthodox, I mean maybe Catholic or Protestant, they brought their crosses and their things like that, little different things and, and they were all just so desperate to try to get God to hear their prayers and they prayed and they prayed and they had ministers and, and pastors praying and then lo and behold, if uh, the wind began to blow a little bit and the mist began to come and the clouds got darker and darker and then a soft shower began to fall. And people's tears began to come down people's eyes as they were so thankful of God sending the rain. And people held up their crosses and held up their Bibles. But amid, amidst all the scene of all the trinkets and all the things that the people had, the greatest symbol of faith was a little nine-year-old girl. And there she stands with her umbrella in her hand. She believed God. Amen. Trust. Trust. There's the paradox of it and there's the priority of it. God says, I want you to give sacrificially. Trust the ways of God. And there's the purpose of it, verses 15 and 16. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he in her house did eat many days. I do want you to notice that God had said in verse number 9, he commanded this woman. You say, how did he command her? Verse 15 by the word of Elijah. She had no idea of this before Elijah ever told her that. God used this prophet to tell his words to her, just like God uses people to tell you God's word, just like God will use you to tell people his word. You'll notice the purpose of it, verses 15 and 16. Verse 16, the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. The purpose of it was enough supply for each day. Much like the ravens bringing bread and flesh in the morning and evening, daily bread. Only a handful, that's all it took. But you know, it really depends on whose hand is full. <laughs> whether it's your hand or whether it's his hand. It's interesting, this whole thing about the hand and the story of Elijah, we're going to see later on when that cloud begins to come up, it's like a little man's hand coming up. You say, I'm preacher, I just don't have anything now. This inflation, uh, Biden, Bidenomics isn't helping me too well here. Well, you know what? Sometimes you just have to, li you have to live from hand to mouth. God's hand to our mouths. Just let God feed us. Just let God feed us. You ever think about it? If God would have gave her all the food, this is what I believe happened. I believe she had the barrel of meal. And uh, she had just enough down in there to, to get out and, and make one, one cake, and it was empty. Then the next day, she'd go back, and there's some more in there. And she'd look over there in the little cruise of, uh, with oil, and there's some more oil in there. It wasn't a full barrel enough to last for months. It wasn't a full uh, thing of, uh, of oil. It was just enough for that day. You say, why? Well, what would have happened if word had gotten out that she had a whole barrel full of meal? People would have been coming from all over the place. They would have found Elijah. Remember, Elijah is in hiding. God is doing some things in a very particular way. He's got a reason for the reason that you ran out of gas. He's got a reason for the fact that you don't have a drive and you don't have a ride right now and maybe you don't think you can pay rent next month or whatever the situation is going on in your life, he's got a reason for that. Yeah. Our job is to trust his word and to trust his ways. Amen. God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Yeah. Wow. 
And she trusted and she did what God said. And thank God for it. Finally, two more and we'll be done. Not just trusting the word of God, trusting the ways of God, but trusting the work of God. Notice in verse number 13 what Elijah says. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said. When you trust the work of God, it will bring peace. Fear not. When you trust the work of God, look in verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. It will not only bring peace, but it will bring you a promise. God's work, and when you trust His work, that's what He'll do. He'll give you peace, and He'll give you a promise. And the Bible's full of promises. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So He brings peace. He brings promise. Notice also verses 15 and 16. We already read it. But He brings the provisions that you need. An unknown Confederate soldier wrote this poem. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Amen. Almost despite myself, my own spoken prayers were answered. I am, a, I am among all men most richly blessed. That's how God does things. That's God's work. That's God's work. Not only do we trust the word of God, the ways of God, the work of God, finally we trust the woes from God. The woes from God. Let's read the last part of the chapter. The woes from God. Verse number 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Trusting the woes from God. The woes. Sometimes life deals you a rough hand. Like I said yesterday, sometimes you get sucker punched. Maybe some of you don't know that. Some of you guys, maybe you're roughhouse, maybe you've sparred, you've fought some. You ever been hit off guard? Yes. If you ever do, I probably shouldn't say this, but young guys, if you ever have to fight somebody, I'm just saying, they approach you, they walk up to you, and they're about to fight you. Immediately, you attack them. You don't wait. You catch them off guard. And you strike. Because, boy, when you get sucker punched, yes. it will knock the snot out of you. Yes. It will knock the breath out of you. And sometimes when you go through life, what will happen is the Lord will allow a situation tragic like this. And can I say this? For those of you that have gone through tragedy in life, you understand what I'm talking about. Dealing with tragedy is a whole lot harder than dealing with other trouble in life. Yes. And tragedy will literally set you back. And like I mentioned before, you need to be patient with the Lord and be patient with yourself. You just don't jump right back into the race after you've been sucker punched. You've got to give yourself some time to catch your breath. Okay? 
And so just put that in the back of your mind. If and when tragedy comes in your life, and it probably will, maybe you'll remember that. And remember that the Lord loves you. He loves you unconditionally. Don't doubt his love. So here this lady, she loses her son, and you'll notice, first of all, the censure. And by that, I mean there's blame being thrown around. Notice that uh, when the boy dies, Elijah's blamed. And she also not only blames Elijah, but she blames herself. She says, you're bringing my sin back to remembrance. There's something that went on in her past, and she's thinking, oh no, my ships are finally come in. Uh, The Bible hadn't been written as far as Galatians yet, but hey, Paul said, if you sow something, you're going to reap it. Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Man, it's coming back to me. And by the way, that should incite you to fear God and to serve God because I'm telling you, the Lord will not allow sin to go unpunished. However, let me say this. If you will be like Ahab, we're not going to get to it, but Ahab, later on, he finally walks softly. He humbles himself. I have found if you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you know what? He will punish you less than your iniquities deserve. And God has treated me a whole lot better than I deserve to be treated. He has spanked me a whole lot less than I probably should have been spanked. But that's the first response, and that's a natural response. When tragedy comes in your life, you think, oh, it's my fault. I go ahead and put this back in the, in the reserves to use it later on, because you go through this whole cycle when you go through tragedy, you'll blame yourself sometimes for things that cannot be helped. It wasn't her fault that her son died. And it wasn't Elijah's fault that her son died. And you want to get that. You want to understand the woes of God. The censure goes out. The blame gets cast. Elijah's blamed. The lady's blamed. And then what does Elijah do? Elijah turns right around and blames God. Lord, why have you killed this boy? This woman has done what you told her to do. She's taken care of me. And now you've killed this boy. So we have the censure, but then we have the setback. Now, God is doing something here. And he will use tragedy to bring about a triumph. God will do that. Now you think about it. I mentioned it kind of briefly earlier. She said, I have not. But she didn't list all the things she had. She had some meal, just a handful. She had a barrel. She had a little bit of oil. and She had a cruise. And she had a son. She gave all the other stuff to God. There's only one thing she hadn't given to him yet. And that was her boy. Look what Elijah says if you'll notice the wording. Look at the wording. Look at it in verse number 19. Give me thy son. Give me thy son. You know, sometimes we really... We think we've given it all to Jesus. All to Jesus, I surrender. That that song we sang earlier, all of my life from that very hour, I've yielded to his control. I'm a big fat liar. (laughs) I have not yielded to his control all of my life. We probably should put a little something, I've tried to yield to his control. I want to yield to his control. But sometimes we actually think we've sacrificed everything for the Lord. And then the Lord will reveal something to us. And you'll be like, oh. You mean the Lord wants my career? What if he said, turn in your resignation Monday morning? You really mean the Lord wants my, where I live? What if the Lord said, pack up your bags next week? We think we sacrifice. But sometimes it takes tragedy. It takes the woes of God to get us to a place where we're really willing to trust Him completely with everything. Some of you parents, I pray for you. I I pray for you in these desperate times. It's a rough time to have children. And the heartache that Probably you're going to face some of you in all these years. I'm not trying to, I'm just being factual. All of the kids that come up in Bible believing churches don't turn out. They don't all serve Jesus with their lives. But you've got to be willing to let, let them go and let God have them. In Mark chapter number 9, the man brings his son 
uh, to Jesus Christ. You don't have to turn there. You can just jot it down if you want the reference. Mark 9, 17. This is the phrase that I got out of that. I used it actually for Father's Day. But he, he, the Bible says, he said to Jesus, he said, I have brought unto thee my son. He brought his son to Jesus. That's the best person you can bring your son to. Yeah. Yeah. The setback was she just, she gave everything but her son. She, that was one thing she was not willing to let go of. And until that one thing is let go of, God's not going to get glory. What did Jesus tell the young ruler? He said, this one thing thou lackest, but you need to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. This one thing. Everything else is great. Oh, you got all these other disciplines of the Christian life. Boy, we're good with our disciplines. We memorize our verses. We read our Bibles. We check off our little list. Man, we could be spiritual policemen. <laughs> what about that one thing that nobody knows about? Your pastor doesn't know about, your wife doesn't know about, your husband doesn't know about, your mother, your father doesn't know about, your brothers, your sisters don't know about. Only God, you, and the devil know about it. What's that one thing that you hadn't let go of yet? That's trust. The faith of trust. The censure, the setback, then the solution, verse number 19, give me thy son. Give me thy son. Notice in verse number 24, her assurance comes as a result of this that takes place. She said, by this I know thou art a man of God. Now let me say this. It's amazing when you think about all the miracles that she had seen through the many days, which would have been three years. <laughs> That's a long time to eat cornbread, man. <laughs> I like corn. Hey, I could eat cornbread and black-eyed peas. I don't have to have a pork chop. Although, you get a fried pork chop, cornbread, black-eyed peas, and sweet iced tea, you are almost in the millennium. <laughs> Close. Uh, but I couldn't imagine just eating, eating a little bit of meal a whole three years. But she had seen all of this take place. God miraculously putting the the meal in the barrel and going back to it every morning and seeing the oil in the cruise every morning. But it takes the death and the resurrection of her son to finally say, I know that, thou, that the word of God in thee is of a truth. Here's the problem. The problem is even as Bible believers, and I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, we often become sign seekers. Yes, yes. We get more excited about the little quote-unquote miracle that really can be interpreted based on your own kind of vantage point. I'm not being a Mr. Killjoy, but I am pretty, uh, uh, what, what's the word, uh, uh, skeptical. What's the word, skeptical, I guess. I'm very skeptical. I'm skeptical of myself. I look in the mirror and say, what are you up to? <laughs> <laughs> but what happens even as Bible believers, if you are always looking for the little feeling or the sign, or you're just waiting for the goosebumps to come all the way up, to start on your spine and come all the way up the back of your neck, and you're waiting for that perfect, if, if Brother Pastor Jay picks this particular song, I'm going to know it's an answer to prayer. It's kind of like playing, playing Bible roulette. You know, you flip through there and 1 Chronicles 1, Adam, Sheth, Enos, Adam, uh, Sheth, Enos, Mahalalel, Jared. So then you do it 500 times until you find the right verse. You know. Bible believers, you know, you're going down the road and all of a sudden you're like, oh no, oh no, oh no. I'm not out of gas. God put gas in my gas tank. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> if you are a sign seeker, you know what's going to happen? One miracle is not going to be enough for you. Yeah, it's going to take another one and another one and another one and another one. Now by this I know that the word of God. What do you mean now by this? God's been putting meal in a barrel. He's been putting oil in a cruise for all these days. And you don't think God's speaking through this man? We need to trust the word of God, the ways of God, and the woes of God. What the woes of God will do, they'll get us to that place where we're willing to trust God, not just the miracles of God. And it goes back to our whole theme. It trusts in the provider, not just the provisions. Yeah. 
Well, trust in the woes of God. Trust in the work of God, the ways of God, and the Word of God. Trust. Willing to do what God called you to do. Don't trust your eyesight. Trust what God says. I don't know what's going on overseas as far as the nation of Israel goes. I don't know some of the details that we try to work out and we try to you know, find out you know, uh, what kind of toenail polish are going to be on the ten toes <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't understand. I don't know what's going to take place. I don't know how far things will be allowed to go, whether we will see maybe a temple erected in Jerusalem, some type of tabernacle structure, whether Jews from here are going to go over there. I don't know some of those details, and I'm really not going to get bogged down in that. There's enough that I do know that I can stay focused on. The problem is we get so bogged down in all these other things instead of simply trusting what God has told us to do by faith today. Amen. To do. We need to trust in our faith. We are Bible believers. We trust the Word of God. I don't care if they put out some type of code that was connected to your Social Security number and your bank ID and you had to have this code everywhere you went. I'm not worried. Amen. I know what the Bible says. I don't care what I see. I don't care if little images start popping up, holograms in my living room. I don't really care. <laughs> I might get the shotgun after them. Yeah. By the way, there is a shotgun in my room. I killed a snake with him just the other day. That's one of the best defenses, not just a shotgun, but other guns. Don't let me get off on that. However, let me say this. I don't care what takes place as far as technology goes, what takes place where the nations go. We have a general outline of how things are going to be. I believe what the Bible says. In this age, I'm saved by grace through faith and the finished work of Christ. I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. I cannot lose my salvation. Well, if you get the vaccine, you're going to take the mark of the beast. You're an idiot. That's not the mark of the beast. Trust the Word of God. Amen. Don't read the Bible through the lens of some news Amen. program that you watch. Amen. Some prophecy expert. Yes. God called all of us to preach the gospel of the grace of God primarily. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for sinners and the return of Jesus Christ. All of this overemphasis on prophecy will get you into trouble. Yes. And you can take any other schism or ism and put it in its place and you'll become a sign seeker and the next thing you know, you're not trusting God anymore. You're just looking for some other sign. Trust God. Be obedient to God. Maybe some of you know the name, an old preacher who's been dead for years. I had the privilege of meeting him back in the early 90s. His name was Harold Seitler. And he was an old time preacher and he preached in South Carolina. At, at one time, he had the largest church in South Carolina. He was a gravelly old preacher, independent Baptist, really a strong, uh, strong part of the fundamentalist movement back in the day. That's actually the church Dr. Upman attended when he was at Bob Jones University. And Harold Seitler's little baby got killed. And it was on a Saturday. Well, Sunday morning, all the people are at the church. They had heard what's happened, and they're all at the church early, and they're just all over the altar praying for the preacher. And he gets up on that Sunday morning and he just doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know if at this point if he can even go on. This weird thing happened. This evangelist had been in the States. He was actually from Germany. And he drove like 150 miles when he got word on Saturday that this little baby had been killed. And he drove to Harold Seitler's house. Sunday morning he knocks on the door. And that, that preacher, he was a young preacher at the time, opened the door and that evangelist came in. And the preacher said, hello. And he said, hey. And the evangelist just looked at him for a little bit and he said, okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> and the evangelist turned around to walk out and the Harold Seitler says, what did you come here for? He said, well, I drove here to see a man the Lord wasn't scared to turn the devil loose on. Wow. See you later. Walked out. Wow. You know what Harold Seitler did? He got dressed. And he went to church and preached. Amen. Talk about woes. 
the woes of life. And God will use those things sometimes to get a hold of you to see if you're going to trust God or not. And I pray that we're willing to trust God. Father, thank you for the text. Thank you for the great examples of the life of Elijah. Lord, help us. We all are in need of your help and your care. God, I pray you'd move in here and minister to your people in a special way. For Jesus' sake, amen.